All right, welcome back to the channel, everybody. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon and The Blackest Heart, both books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today I'm going to be reviewing The Wayfarer Redemption by Sarah Douglas. This is book number one in the Wayfarer Redemption series. I've got the entire series here behind me. Book number two, Enchanter. Book number three, Starman. Four is Sinner. Five is Pilgrim. Six is Crusader. I have not read any of those. In fact, this is the first time I've read this one. Um, let's talk about the covers first. Each one of these books has a great, fantastic cover painting by the great artist... Louis Royo, he's done a ton of stuff, and um, each one of these paintings is just magnificent. A lot of you might recognize him from his David, the, he did a lot of the David Gemmel books, and he did a lot of the Michael Gere and Kathleen O'Neill Gere People of the Wolf series, and a lot of Louis L'Amour westerns, believe it or not. But in this one, let's take a look at this cover. It's got this beautiful painting of our main character, Faraday, and she is in a big cavern. And we're going to talk, we're going to come back to this painting towards the end of the review, because this painting actually reveals some pretty cool things that are going on in the book. So, Wayfarer Redemption series. It's the biggest selling series in the history of Australia as far as fantasy books go. And so the American publisher Tor decided to pick it up and put it out in America. And it did pretty well in America, too, in the 90s. This came out in 1995. Uh, so this is considered like a 1990s fantasy series. Not quite classic fantasy, but it's back there a ways. Its original title in Australia was Battle Axe. I like that title. I love the title Battle Axe. It, um... It goes better, I mean, because we've got Enchanter, Starman, Sinner, Pilgrim, Crusader, Battleaxe. I don't know why they went with the Wayfarer Redemption. I just think it's a weaker title. I love Battleaxe. In fact, when I was first um, writing The Forgetting Moon, I um, just, because I hadn't come up with a title yet, I just named the the word document that I was working as is I just named it battle axe. So for the longest time, the forgetting moon was actually titled simply battle axe. Cause I hadn't thought of a, I actually was considering going with that for the whole, but anyway, long story short, if you're looking for this in Australia, it's under the title battle axe. If you're looking for it in America, it's the Wayfarer redemption. Now there's a map, you know, We've talked about the cover, the Louis Royo covers that wrap around. Beautiful covers. There's also a map in here that I noticed. And there's a place on the map, I don't doubt I can show it to you, but it's called, it's up here in the corner. It's called the Three Bros Lake. Like bro, like B-R-O, the Three Bros Lake. I opened it up and I was like, I want to know, I want to learn about the Three Bros Lake. What is the history of the Three Bros Lake? I don't know, it just struck me as interesting. Didn't get to learn anything about the Three Bros Lake in this book, and maybe we learn about the Three Bros Lake somewhere else. Anyway, the book starts out with a dynamite prologue. A woman wandering through a wintry forest, and she's pregnant. These wraiths surround her. These wraiths are like these legendary bad creatures that sort of stalk the forests and mountains of this fantasy world. And the wraiths take her baby. Prologue's over. Woman dies. Wraiths take the baby. 29 years later, we are introduced to Axis. He is the battle axe. Axis is the battle axe. There's a warrior class of warriors called axe wielders and their commander is just known simply as the battle axe and axis is the commander he is the battle axe he's not that well respected though he's very very good looking very muscular very striking to behold almost ethereal in appearance people are just 
taken aback by how beautiful he is. There's a reason for that. I don't. I won't tell you why, but there's a spoilery thing, a reason for that. His heritage, you know, makes him as such. Uh, but he is a bastard born son. Now he's got a half brother named Bornhald, who's sort of the guy in charge. Now Bornhald is the one that gave Axis his job as commander of the Axe wielders. That's why Axis doesn't really. You know, that's why people are kind of like, well, he was given his job because his brother is the king. And whereas his half-brother is the king, so he was given the title Battle Axe, even though he hadn't really earned it. Anyway, so he's got those issues to overcome. Meanwhile, there's another character named Faraday, who was betrothed to King Bornhald. But once she sees the beautiful Axis, the axe wielder, the Battle Axe, the, he, the, the dude that has the most prestigious title in the realm, even more prestigious than the king himself almost, she is immediately smitten with Axis because he's just super hot. Now we have a love triangle between Bornheld the king, his half-brother Axis, who is the commander of the axe wielders, and our fairy princess girl Faraday, who's also, and she is... You know, she is on the cover here, so you can see that she's a hottie, too. And um, there's a love triangle. So we get started off right with the love triangle, which is good. A lot of people hate love triangles. I think love triangles, cre they're, they're, they're sort of a good way to inject drama into a story that otherwise might not have a lot of drama going for it right off the bat. So... The first drama we get is this um, very dangerous, potentially volatile love triangle between Faraday, Bornhold, and Axis. And not only that, but Faraday and Axis, their interactions together are much more natural than Faraday and Bornhold's, which is more of like, they're, they're sort of being forced to marry each other, whereas Axis and Faraday actually kind of like each other. And their interactions are great, and Faraday... There's a scene which really endeared me to both characters where um, Faraday... M most people know that Axis is a half-blood, a half-brother, and they don't talk about his mother very much at all. She's, like, off-limits. And Faraday, very frankly, speaks to Axis about his mother in very frank and honest terms, and it really endears her to Axis because nobody's ever spoken that honestly to him. And it really endears the reader to both characters. It's a very good way that the author inter, interwove the love tri uh, what could be an awkward love triangle into something that holds your attention and makes you root for both characters. This book here, it's very... I mean, I've got to say that it's kind of like a... It's a to me, it's a mashup of... Um, like, kind of... A raw primitive, it's got a raw primitive Conan the Barbarian feel to it. Um, <clears throat> almost like these characters are just one notch above Stone Age. Like maybe they're just starting to build castles. Uh, um, it's pretty primitive, it seems like. Um, but yet it's 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 medieval in tone. Um, there's uh, references to. Um, uh, stars and people well, well the stargates first of all right at the beginning we get a scene which is a great scene where they adventure into some of the characters kind of go on this little quest and they end up in these barrows these caverns these caves <coughs> and they're searching for a thing called the stargate and they find it and it's actually here on the cover you can kind of see they're in this cavern and the stargate is this circular thing on the floor that has all these little miniature planets and stars sort of hovering around over the top of it. It's very cool. <clears throat> it's supposed to be like a pool of... It's supposed to look like a pool of water, but when you get close to it, you can see it's actually a map of their universe and their stars. And it's very cool. I really was enchanted with that whole scene and the whole journey to get to that scene. So we've got this... Medieval society, a pretty primitive medieval society, but with hints of things happening in outer space. Like, we're, 
we're almost going to have like a space opera because uh, they, they talk about the Stargates, the Starfarers, the Star Men, uh, these uh, winged men from the stars is what they call them. Um, and they're also kind of like relatives of the wraiths that stole the baby at the beginning. Anyway, um, it's just really, really kind of, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it. You know, I'd seen these um, books growing up as they came out in the 90s. I'd always kind of had my eye on them, and I'd never read them until now. And I was just like, yeah, now there's uh, the, some of the nine, some of the stuff that came out in the 90s was pretty fucking dope, and this is pretty fucking dope. I actually really, really was surprised at how much I enjoyed it. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm coughing. The writing is great. The covers are great. I love the Louis Royo covers. The story held my attention. The love triangle propelled me into the story, and then we got into a much more quest-oriented adventure with, you know, the fights and the blood and the guts and all that stuff. It's not just love triangle stuff. Anyway, I just want to give this a good shout-out. I, I give this a good 8.5 out of 10, and I'm looking forward to reading the rest of the books in the series, and... Uh, you know, we'll see what happens.